We were a young country. 30 years of uninterrupted debate over slavery. No range for compromise. Unleashed was a civil war of increasing savagery and enormous destruction. The future was invisible because the past had been a failure. So many little but captivating facts remain in darkness, just waiting to be discovered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, throughout the 1850s, the nation's leaders stretched democratic perimeters to the breaking point. This needs to be pointed out in this day and time. Everyone then was confident that the American system could endure and absorb any blows and then repair itself. Reasonable people went to unreasonable limits. They talked, they argued, they shouted, they threatened, slowly but steadily. The elements of compromise, the only thing that holds democracy together, began to fall apart. They evaporated. The great undertaking of American nationhood, bloated with turmoil by 1861, broke free from intolerance. The future was invisible because the past had been a failure, and civil war came. Now, 30 years of uninterrupted debate over the issue of slavery came to a boil in eight, December 1860 when South Carolina left the Union. James Pettigrew was a federal judge in Charleston, and at the secession of his native state, the venerable jurist growl, it won't work. South Carolina is too small to be a nation and too large to be an insane asylum. <laughs> Yet 10 other states joined South Carolina in a freedom movement that they called the Confederate States of America. And so two nations within a nation faced each other. One president had pledged to preserve the Union at all costs. The other chief executive was leading a pilgrimage to take a third of the states out of the Union. Between them was no space, no room for adjustment, no range for compromise. And even if there had been, immense emotions were swirling about the country. Two things to keep in mind as you study Civil War history. We were a young country, 70 years old when Civil War broke out. Equally as important, of the 27 and a half million white Americans living in 1860, over half were under the age of 21. We were young, naive, and innocent. And so the emotions swirling around the country could not uh, be, be controlled. They were without formality or restraint. And once the guns at Fort Sumter began firing, what they un unleashed was a civil war of increasing savagery and enormous destruction. You know, no matter how long we study Civil War history, what we do not know about the war seems to be more than what we do know. So many little but captivating facts remain in darkness, just waiting to be discovered. The personal element in war is what I stress. It's too often totally overlooked. Look at a battle map, and you'll see inanimate red and blue lines and those red and blue lines are misleading. They are, in fact, thousands of young men summoned to do a dreadful job. They, as well as families and friends left behind, often experience things that deserve our attention and our remembrance. The untold Civil War is the first major attempt to accomplish that task of looking at the little hidden but quite human events of the war. There's a story of two brothers who fought on opposite sides, yet held hands as they died on the same battlefield. When Lincoln grew a beard, the great locomotive chase, personal sidelights on Fort Sumter and Gettysburg and Cold Harbor, a mass execution of 22 deserters, and the occasion when the sternly pious Stonewall Jackson became hopelessly intoxicated are highlights. That's a highlight in and of itself, being someone who's quite familiar with the general. 
One cannot look at human behavior in that war without encountering the humor of Abraham Lincoln. It was always there. It was his necessary crutch to keep on going. As he once said, I have to laugh, otherwise I will cry. That's all. That's all. And this humor was ever present. Late in 1863, in refusing a man who wanted a pass to Richmond, Lincoln stated, I would gladly give you the pass if it would do any good. But in the last two years, I have given passes to 200,000 soldiers, and not one of them has managed to get there yet. <laughs> no story of army life, however, in the 1860s would be complete without mentioning pets. Many regiments on both sides had mascots. They ran the gauntlet of the animal kingdom. Dogs, cats, raccoons, possums, chickens, pig, two bears, and a camel that we can tabulate. Yet the most famous of all the Civil War's mascots was a male bald eagle. The 8th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment left for war with an eaglet donated by Chippewa Indians. Soldiers named the bird Old Abe. And in some ways, the eagle was a pitiful sight. A strong cord bound him to a perch atop a wooden pole. His wings were continually clipped to keep him from flying away. Nevertheless, the eagle's fame spread throughout the Union armies in the Western theater. He was not only a curiosity, he became an inspiration and a motivation. The 8th Wisconsin became known as the Eagle Regiment, and Old Abe was in at least three dozen engagements. He always found battle stimulating, and he would react by flapping his wings and screeching loudly. The bird never received a bottle wound, an amazing thing, because he was a prime target for Confederate sharpshooters. Two monuments, enduring monuments, exist to the Eagle. One is the Wisconsin State Monument on the Vicksburg battlefield. But the other memorial originated in World War II, and it is still in use. It is one of the most revered shoulder patches in existence. Yes, you're right. It belongs to the 101st Airborne Division, which calls itself the Screaming Eagles. Old Abe would like that. Now, every Civil War historian has to confront folklore, uh, and it's especially heavy in the field of the Civil War. And it becomes particularly so when you talk about espionage in the war. Espionage was in its infancy. It was not the sophisticated science it has become. The point to make here is that in the Civil War, for every James Bond you will encounter, there will be at least two maximal smarts in the neighborhood. <laughs> now, among the best of these successful spies, as both Lincoln and Grant acknowledged, was a lady, Elizabeth Van Loo. The daughter of a prosperous Richmond merchant, Lizzie Van Loo, was well-educated and highly intelligent. She inherited the mercantile business at her father's death. By the time of the Civil War, uh, Lizzie was in her uh, mid-forties, a small, dowdy spinster with darting blue eyes and seemingly nervous disposition. She was a staunch Unionist who refused to cooperate in any way with the Southern Confederacy or Southern-minded people in Richmond. In public, she adopted a dress and a manner to give every impression that she was totally insane. And she succeeded completely. Richmond citizens learned to keep their distance from Crazy Betsy, as she was widely called. Sympathetic local officials gave her permission to visit captured Union soldiers in Libby Prison, just down the hill from the uh, Van Loo Mansion. And there she went almost daily, taking in food, but bringing out military information that prisoners had overheard and relaying it through the lines to Union command posts. Escaping federal soldiers from Libby would use her home as a first step refuge in their flight northward to freedom. When Union soldiers occupied Richmond in April 1865, General U.S. Grant publicly commended Van Loo for sending what he called the most valuable information received from Richmond during the war. In 1869, President Grant added insult to injury by appointing Van Loo postmaster of Richmond. She held the position throughout the eight-year Grant administration. She then moved to Washington, 
whereupon Richmond officials confiscated her home and turned it into an insane asylum. <laughs> the exiled, friendless Van Lu eventually returned to Richmond, and she spent the remainder of her life with a niece and 40 cats. Few people attended her funeral in 1900. An elaborate gravestone soon adorned the burial site. The gravestone was a gift from appreciative families of Massachusetts soldiers. Now, Arlington National Cemetery is the nation's largest shrine to fallen heroes. Its breathtaking beauty overshadows its disreputable beginnings. George Washington Custis, the stepson and namesake of our first president, inherited the property in 1802. Custis set out to build a combination mansion and shrine to the father that he adored. He called the place Arlington after the Custis family's first home on Virginia's eastern shore. Custis and his wife had one child, a daughter, Murray. In 1831, she married a young officer, Robert E. Lee, and Arlington became the only real home that Army Officer Lee would have for 30 years. It was at Arlington in April 1861 that Lee made the decision to offer his sword to his native Virginia by claiming he could not lift his sword against his birthright and his country. In 1861, when Civil War began, the Lee family had been Virginians for 225 years. Virginia was Lee's home. Well, when Lee went south to take to cast his lot with the Confederacy, federal officials immediately seized the Arlington estate. The quartermaster of the Union armies was an individual named Montgomery Meigs. He was a brilliant engineer, but uncontrollably vindictive. He considered all Confederates, including his own brother, to be nothing less than traitors. To punish his longtime friend, Lee, for siding with Virginia, Meigs determined to turn Arlington into a vast cemetery. Unauthorized burials began there in May 1864. When the Secretary of War endorsed the idea, Meigs began burying every Union body he could obtain, and he had them placed as close to the mansion as possible to ensure that the Lee Custis home would forever be uninhabitable. At first, it was no honor to be buried at Arlington, only those who could not be identified or those whose families could not afford the cost of a private funeral were put there. With time, a positive transformation began. It ended in 1955 when the Arlington Mansion was dedicated as a memorial to General Lee. Today, more than 230,000 dead lie in the 600-acre tract. An average of 18 funerals are held there daily. Two events round out the story. In 1882, Montgomery Meigs died. By his order, he was buried a stone's throw from the front steps to the mansion. Later that same year, the U.S. Supreme Court found the federal government guilty of illegal seizure of the Arlington estate. The high court awarded the Lee family both the property and $150,000 in damages. The Lees took the money. It was too late to do anything else with the property. And so the cemetery remains a monument to bitter feelings engendered by a civil war, as well as a reminder of the ongoing cost of American freedom. The American conflict of the 1860s is often called the war first, and there's a chapter on that because this war produced so many innovations that it dominates American life. You would not believe how much of your life goes back to the Civil War. Let's begin with a startling and somewhat embarrassing example. The North's first ironclad ship was christened USS Monitor. It had no deck. Crew members were therefore unable to practice a naval tradition that when they had to, and then I'm using a Civil War phrase, answer the imperative call of nature. They would come on deck, wet a finger to see which way the wind was blowing, and then squat on the railing to relieve themselves. But in this ironclad vessel, such was not possible. And naval officers went at once to see the inventor, John Erickson. They explained the problem, and Erickson 
responded by designing one of the closest friends each of us has. He called it a water chest. You know it better as a commode, a potty, a privy, a throne. Thus, whenever you have to go to the bathroom, you are engaging in a bit of Civil War history. At least I hope you are. <laughs> Among other Civil War firsts, when you joined the Army in 1860, you were given the uniform. Whether you were five feet two or six feet four, whether you weighed 100 or 300 pounds, you were given the uniform. And Montgomery Meigs, our old quartermaster friend, uh, looked out at the first recruits, first wave of recruits coming into Washington, and he thought them to resemble an international convention of clowns. <laughs> and so out from Meg's office went a directive to every uniform manufacturer in the North. Henceforth, they would not make one uniform, they would make four. And they would call them small, medium, large, and extra large. Pre-sized clothing, which every one of us uses, originated in the Civil War. So did canned goods. So did paper money. So did home delivery of mail. So did standard time, pairs of shoes, prosthetic limbs, veterans hospitals, welfare agencies, and the first major steps by American women to become the social equal of men. Ladies, in 1860, you could not vote. In most states, you were forbidden to own property. But the flood of men into the armies left a vast vacuum behind the lines and it were women who stepped forward in three areas to fill the gaps. The first area was in machinery, machine shops, and they came in to operate the machines, producing the military uh, goods for the armies. At first, they wore their hoop skirts, which brought about some disasters when all that material would occasionally get caught into the machines. To obliterate this, uh, eliminate it rather, the, the women began to borrow the trousers of their husbands, sons, or brothers, and they came forward with slacks, which I would suspect 90% of you ladies are wearing tonight. That originated in the Civil War. When the schoolmasters went off to war, education came to a standstill until women stepped forward, volunteering as teachers. They added a new word to our vocabulary, schoolmistress. And it was in the field of nursing, finally, that they stepped forward, gritted their teeth, and looked at the horror and smelled the stench and viewed the awful situations of men being killed and wounded in battle. And from that war as well came America's happiest day of the year. That day, of course, is Christmas. And our Christmas would be nothing without the impact of the Civil War. The Yuletide we all love began with Thomas Nast, son of German immigrants. A gifted artist, Nast was only 22 when he joined the staff of the country's most popular magazine, Harper's Weekly. Near the start of the 1862 Christmas period, Nast created the first Santa Claus. His initial Santa Claus wore stars and stripes uniform. The sheer genius of his first drawing is evident here because when you look at it, you don't necessarily see Santa Claus first. What you see is the joy and happiness on the faces of Union soldiers, which is exactly why he had created the figure in the first place. Remember, the name Santa Claus originated with Nast and not some earlier poet or writer. And Nast imagined Santa Claus to be what he has become, round-bellied, white-bearded, fur-clad, a jolly, bright-eyed, with a sprig of holly in his cap. Quite in contrast with St. Nicholas and Kris Kringle and other European depictions of the Christmas spirit, Santa Claus was the embodiment of good cheer, a patron saint who one day each year lets every one of us become a child again. It is from the hand and talent of Thomas Nast that we get, got a number of symbols in American editorial page cartoons and journals. Uh, it was Nast, for example, who created the Democratic donkey, the Republican elephant, the figure of Uncle Sam, John Bull, the personification of England. All of these came from Nast. And yet, in spite of all these contributions, this adopted American is still most remembered as the man who made Santa Claus. 
Look at Civil War photographs and paintings. Most of you will miss something in the majority of Army scenes. It was perhaps the most forgotten element in the Civil War. For 2,000 years, man's basic transportation and his major co-worker was the horse. Centuries ago, a philosopher observed that the horse was the noblest conquest man has ever made. Horses were an indispensable part of life, especially with the coming of war in 1861. And this brings us to a misconception that Hollywood has perpetuated for decades. Movies always show mounted warriors staging an attack. The defenders open fire, the riders topple to the ground, and the horses gallop away unharmed. In reality, the opposite was the case. Horses were the first target in a battle. Kill the animals. The riders become dismounted, and the fighting can continue with both sides on the same level. In similar fashion, shoot or bayonet the artillery horses, and the other side's cannon become immobilized. Army horses in the 1860s never had an easy time. Half of them went into battle and were killed. Cavalrymen used and abused horses with an indifference born of the passion to survive. Artillery horses had to drag heavy cannon through all the elements, and once they got to the front lines, the life expectancy under fire was measured in a matter of minutes. For every horse killed in battle, three others died from exhaustion, starvation, exposure, mistreatment, and such widespread diseases as glanders and sore tongues. The worst Civil War photograph I know is this one. It was taken on the Antietam battlefield. It was the mount of a Confederate officer who was killed. His body was dragged off. The equipment was taken away from the horse. The horse is dying, and he's lying there, looking at the camera, breathing his last. They were faithful servants to the end. They gave no interviews. They left no memoirs. They filed for no pensions. They simply obeyed all the way to death. Some one and a half million horses died in the Civil War. Not one of them was ever given a decent burial. Now, the Civil War did not end with the ceasefire at Appomattox. Over 700,000 vacant chairs stood around American dining rooms. The first assassination of a president dampened victory spirits. Executing four of the conspirators seemed to be empty retribution. The hanging four months later of a Confederate prison commandant was a little more than vengeance. With Lincoln's hand no longer at the helm, a vindictive Congress moved to make the South pay even more for its sins of secession. To make the nation one in whole, Northern and Southern soldiers fought one of the most destructive wars in history. Indeed, if this war broke out today in four years from now, the losses in the Civil were in the same proportion to population now as they were then. This nation would lose six million men. That will begin to give you an idea of the devastation in human form the war took. These men fought that war with a fierce passion. There were wounds that would take a long time to heal, and there were scars no amount of time would remove. However, as the post-war years passed, a strange, wonderful thing happened. Union and Confederate veterans alike realized that not only had they survived the most horrible war of the 19th century, they came also to understand and to appreciate what the other side had endured. Johnny Rebs never apologized for what they had done, and Billy Yanks never asked them to do so. And soon a strange comradeship drew them to battlefield reunions, and there they came to stand and remember where once they had stood and fought. They came together to be together. And in 1913, on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, some 50,000 Civil War veterans attended a 10-day reunion. And when it was time to go, the old soldiers shook hands and made their way collectively toward the same sunset. The Civil War was many things. Fundamentally, it was a very human, extremely emotional, truly unforgettable chapter in the evolution of our nation. The war contains sadness, humor, 
revulsion, inspiration, the many aspects of the struggle are what I have sought hard to convey in the human civil war, untold civil war. And I genuinely hope that you will like it. Thank you very much. Thank you.